uh, see, some of y'all thought you was about to get out of this series without us touching your issue. <laughs> but I'm here, boo boo. <laughs> Welcome to another episode of our mega church messiness series. I've been waiting for this girl. Several besties have requested that we look into Pastor Mike Todd of Transformation Church in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And when our besties ask for something, we always try to deliver. Through our research, we've discovered that people's main issue with Mike is his attention-grabbing and clout-chasing antics that take the focus off of preaching the gospel. In addition to that, some don't think he's fit to lead his congregation. Not another Joel Osteen. What is Mike Todd's goal here in his church, his massive growing church and becoming such a popular pastor? Where's his foundation at? Where are his standards? Where are his boundaries? This guy's boundaries, they're not really existent. He's just kind of doing what he, what he wants to do and there's no real accountability there. Today, we'll be digging deep into his most controversial moments that have rubbed people the wrong way. Oh, it's gonna be messy, ain't it? I can't wait. For those of you who think we're completely out of line for our mega church content, kiss my ass, kiss my ass. If you don't like our content, please get to stepping because we don't give a damn. Kiss my ass, kiss my ass. <laughs> Kiss my but for the rest of y'all, <laughs> sit back, relax, and bust open a bag of your favorite goodies from rrgsnacks.com, our online concession stand that has an assortment of brisket and bacon jerky, butter toffee peanuts, and gummy sour peach rings. Have y'all put them gummy sour peach rings in your margarita yet? I ain't playing. Y'all try that. Yes, girl. All that tequila gets sopped up, gets sopped up in them sour peach rings. Y'all need to try it. Now, you know we love us a little backstory. And this one starts in 1977 when the late Bishop Carlton Pearson launched his own ministry called Higher Dimensions. In 1981, along with Pastor Gary McIntosh, whom he had met while attending Oral Roberts University, they started Higher Dimensions Evangelistic Center. Pastors Tommy and Brenda Todd moved to Oklahoma that same year to work with Bishop Pearson. The gang all together. On November 16th, 1986, Tommy and Brenda welcomed their son, Mike Todd. A damn Scorpio. Sis, I know it. I know it. Shh. Listen to the rest of the story, girl. Don't start with me today. Do not start with me today, okay? Although his parents were pastors, Mike was more drawn to doing hood rat things with his friends. It's always the preacher's kids, ain't it? Always the PKs. He was wilding out as a teenager and put himself in various situations that caused his life to fall into a very dark place. He even got arrested for unknown reasons. Unknown reasons? Oh, y'all just don't want to say. Don't nobody just get arrested for unknown reasons. They got a reason. They got a reason for putting him in handcuffs now. What is it? The McIntoshes decided to leave Bishop Pearson and the Todds at Higher Dimensions to start Greenwood Christian Center sometime around 1999 in South Tulsa, Oklahoma. In a sermon, Mike said he was 13 at the time and was too busy watching adult movies on the internet to be bothered by what the McIntoshes had going on. Say what? Mike later said he was addicted to the movies, but was able to kick his habit a few years ago. The devil is a lie. I ain't never met a man who kicked that habit. Okay, tell that lie to somebody else. As a child, Mike had an interest in music, so he helped the Macintoshes out by being the sound man for Greenwood Christian Center and other churches. On the side, he also worked as a musician and a music producer. Around that same time, Mike's parents started their own church. Eventually, the McIntoshes felt they needed to move their church from South Tulsa to North Tulsa's Greenwood District, the same location as the 1921 Tulsa Race Massacre. The Tulsa Race Massacre was when countless black residents lost their lives. More than 1,000 homes and businesses were burned down, and one of the wealthiest black communities in the U.S., also known as Black Wall Street, was destroyed by the hands of a white mob. You can read more about the Tulsa Race Massacre in the New York Times article linked in our description box. Child, my blood pressure go up every Black History Month. You know that? Every Black History Month, my blood pressure just shoots. God, God, just be mad. Because a white man was trying to set up his church in a historically black district, a lot of people were ticked off. They felt like the last thing they needed was a white savior to save the black community. However, the McIntoshes went forward with their plans in an attempt to reverse the massacre curse. They moved to their new North Tulsa location in 1999 and changed the name to Transformation Church. 
A couple of years later, 15-year-old Mike met a 14-year-old girl named Natalie, and they started dating. During an appearance on The Breakfast Club, Mike admitted that there was a 10-month period of their relationship that turned into complete insanity. He cheated on her with multiple women, and Natalie started dating someone else. Well, no sh- Damn, was they even together? He was going at it like that? As he struggled with which direction he wanted to take his life, he remembered the faith and principles he was taught when he was younger. He was led back to reading the Bible, and the darkness that was surrounding him turned into light. He and Natalie reconciled. However, because of the havoc he caused, he spent the next 10 years trying to regain her trust. He should have been in therapy, hell. And I guess he didn't go. That's why we got this story, right? (laughs) Right? Shh. One day, Mike's mom told him, God told me you're supposed to do something with the youth. Mike was a bit confused. I said, you have four other sons. <laughs> and you only have seven people in your church. Why would you, why would I be doing anything with the youth? She said, God said, you're supposed to do something with the youth. He was also completely uninterested. His dream was to move to Los Angeles or New York and make music. But his mom was adamant about her prophecy. He had never preached a message. Hell, he had never even prepped a sermon. But a couple of weeks after chatting with his mom, he decided to form a youth group at his parents' church. He called the group So Fly. He said he gonna have that music group one way or the other. (laughs) Who names a youth group So Fly in the church? Sold out free life youth. So Fly, our mascot was a fly. That's good. It was great. (laughs) He admitted that he had no idea what he was doing. In an interview with Rich Wilkerson Jr., Mike said that he just told Bible stories that he learned from the animated series, McGee and Me. (laughs) Girl, I know you lying. McGee and Me? Child, you should have been watching MacGyver to see how you was going to make your way out of that situation. (laughs) That's what you should have been watching. About seven people showed up, and three of them were his brothers. It, Jesus. Mike's message to the youth group was, there's more to life than sleeping with people, popping pills, and smoking weed. That sound fun as hell, though. <laughs> I'm just saying. Within six months, attendance to the youth group grew to 150 people, while there were only 15 adults attending the main service. Yeah, they didn't have no idea what was going on over there, did they? <laughs> Mike had a podcast. He wasn't having youth service. <laughs> Mike and Natalie got married in 2010, and as of this video, they have four children. Mike continued bouncing back and forth between the Macintosh's church and his parents' church, and eventually the spirit told him, Bring the the two two churches churches together. (laughs) At first, his parents and the Macintosh's said no. But in 2011, they eventually merged the two churches and began working together. Truth be told, some of these other churches need to do that too, though, because how y'all keep the lights on with 10 people in the church? How y'all do that? The preacher, his wife, two kids, that's four right there. Three people in the choir, that's seven. Two ushers, that's nine. That don't leave a one person in the congregation to preach to. (laughs) And who gonna teach Sunday school? That meant Mike was able to work the sound and work as the youth pastor for So Fly under the same roof. As the youth group attendance swelled to 500 people, Mike needed funding to keep the program going. But the church had just gone through a financial crisis, so they were unable to give him any money. In an interview, Mike said he started to teach the youth about tithing. That's one way to do it, ain't it? Need money? Teach tithing. Every time. And then Pastor McIntosh suffered a heart attack. While he was recovering, Mike stepped up to the pulpit to cover for him. Pastor McIntosh eventually returned to the church and said he received a message from God that he needed to install Mike and his wife Natalie as lead pastors. Who the sound guy, honey? Mm -mm. The dude in the sound booth. Mm -mm, The youth pastor of Soul Fly, honey? Mm -mm. Okay then. Mike said, I can't be the pastor of this church. I don't like people that much. At least he honest. But Pastor McIntosh wouldn't take no for an answer. He saw how Mike had led the youth group and was able to encourage the members to give tithes, and he wanted him to bring that same energy to the main service. I bet he did. On February 1st, 2015, Mike went from being the sound guy and the leader of the youth group to the lead pastor. Now that's what you call a come up right there. <laughs> As of this video, church membership continues to grow, and the tithes must be pouring in because Transformation purchased the Spirit Bank Event Center for $10.5 million. Cha-ching. 
In 2016, Mike taught a sermon series called Relationship Goals. About a year later, the series went viral. Because the series was so impactful, he turned it into a book that went on to become a New York Times bestseller and was once in talks to turn the series into a movie. Child, if you ain't been married for longer than 30 years, do not talk to me about marriage or relationship goals, okay? You can't tell me sh- That might just be me. According to the Evangelical Dark Web website, relationship goals is littered with self-love tactics designed to make people feel good rather than to preach the gospel. Because of this, people believe Mike is following the lead of Houston pastor Joel Osteen, who has been accused of being more of a motivational speaker. Pastors writing books is becoming more and more common. It's kind of like they're all reading from the same playbook. They never appear to be content with just preaching the gospel. As attendance swells, writing a book is typically their next move. But shouldn't the Bible be the only book they're promoting? Isn't the word of God enough? Or are these pastors seeking fame and wealth? Uh, yeah. She hit that nail right on the head, didn't she? Okay. A writer for Lucid Books website wrote a list of reasons why a pastor should never become an author. One reason is that it takes away from their pastoral duties. The writer added, gather your thoughts and write when you can, but never do so at the the expense of the flock that the Lord has entrusted you to love and lead. Honey, these pastors don't know nothing about being no shepherd. Y'all remember when Joel Osteen said he ain't had time? He ain't had time to pass. Now, we ain't ones to gossip, but we wouldn't be surprised if many of these pastors are hiring ghost writers to get the job done. Sounds about right. Outsource city, baby. But this is something that we are unable to confirm. Although Mike doesn't have nearly as many published books as Joel Osteen, he's well on his way to building his publishing empire and has even authored a book with his daughter. In a March 2018 sermon that's posted on YouTube, the video begins with the instrumental of Kanye West songs, Can't Tell Me Nothing, bumping in the background, while footage of children playing with money can be seen on the screen. Girl, I know you lying. Hold on, let me go see. We took one for the team and listened to the entire sermon, where Mike talks about finances and giving. He also quotes Luke chapter 6, verse 38. The scripture reads, Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, and shaken together, and running over, shall men give into your bosom. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Although Mike noted that the scripture doesn't directly mention money, he said, The church doesn't want your money. God wants your money. Because if God gets your finances, he has your heart. See, see what you, what you got to realize is God does not need your finances to do anything. You need to give your finances so that you have placed your heart in God's hand. And when he has your heart, he can change your habits. What if I like my habits, though? I'm just saying. I'm just asking for a friend. He went on to say that God holds back things until he gets your heart. In other words, don't expect to receive financial blessings if you ain't paying them tithes. Well, damn. Now, what's wrong with this message? Well, for those of you who are addicted to our mega church messiness series, you already know that a tithe is 10% of a parishioner's income that they give to the church. And many are taught that those who don't tithe are robbing from God. According to the OK Eagle website, after Mike's sermon, over 250 members became tithers to the ministry. This brings into question whether parishioners were giving tithes and offerings to put their love for God before their worldly wealth, or were they being guilt tripped into handing over? Over 10% of their income. I'll take guilt trip for 200, Alex. <laughs> Just like other churches in our mega church messiness series, Transformation Church preaches the prosperity gospel. The prosperity gospel states that God blesses those he favors with material wealth and health. On the church's website, it reads, We believe that as part of Christ's work of salvation, it's the Father's will for believers to become whole, healthy, and successful in all areas of life. The problem with this teaching is that it brings forth a transactional relationship with God rather than a relationship based on unconditional love. A writer for a website stated, We shouldn't serve him to get something from him, but we should serve and obey him because we love him and desire his glory. Okay. But still, the prosperity gospel is a fast-growing movement that many parishioners believe will pull them out of poverty or illness through devotion. 
When he isn't encouraging the church's members to give, Mike is looking for ways to go viral. And during a January 2022 performance, <clears throat> I mean, sermon, all hell broke loose. Lord, here we go. Shh, just wait for the rest of the story, girl. If you shush me one more time, I'm going to start leaving your ass at home. After leading a man to the pulpit to illustrate a Bible story in which Jesus healed a blind man, Mike reenacted the biblical scene by spitting in his hand multiple times and then smearing it on the man's face. That's nasty as hell. Although Mike's unhygienic sermon was his attempt to teach Christians to keep faith in God even when the vision didn't make sense, people were outraged and called the spectacle horrifying and disgusting. Mm-hmm. He had a flashback to all them adult movies he watched when he was 13. <laughs> I told y'all he wasn't delivered from that mess. The question is, did the person he spit on just sit there and take it, or did he ball up his fist just a little bit? I wish the cameraman would show what his fist did. Was the <laughs> fist balled up at his side? <laughs> Trendy churches, by and large, put much of their effort into the way they present something. But unfortunately, too often, these methods distract from the message. The method of presentation should complement the message, not distract from it. And there were a few people who came to Mike's defense. Some stated that saliva has medicinal purposes, while others said Mike's actions didn't compare to what other shepherds have committed against their flocks. They sound dumb as hell. The following day, Mike hopped online and stated that after re-watching the footage, he agreed it was disgusting and gross. No sh Sherlock. That, that was a distraction to what I was really trying to do. I was really trying to make the word come alive and for people to see the story. But yesterday it got too live and I own that. I love you guys. I appreciate everybody that's been praying for us and sending us messages. And to anybody who just saw that three minute clip, I really encourage you to go back and watch the whole message. There's some truth and some life in there that could potentially change your whole life. This ninja. And this is precisely why a writer for The Guardian called Mike a preacher influencer, something he's more concerned with getting likes and views. And since his sermons are geared toward a younger demographic, he's doing anything and everything to appeal to their short attention spans. Mike has proven that there's no limit to the amount of stunts he'll pull during his services. For example, in May 2020, he jumped off the stage during a Sunday night service and crowd surfed through the auditorium. Child, is this church or Coachella? And then for Easter Sunday 2023, the church put on an edgy play called Ransom to replace the traditional retelling of the Easter story. There were pyrotechnics and musical renditions of worldly songs, such as Beyonce's Formation, where a woman sings, Okay, demons, now let's get in formation. I know you lie. In another performance, three women are talking about one woman's small booty. Friends, I don't have a fatty. Bro. Girl, we keep telling you it's okay. Your little booty matter too, friend. Oh, no. Just throw the whole church away, honey. Just throw the whole church away and start over. Mm -hmm. When the footage made its way online, the backlash grew rapidly. Everyone knew Mike's dream was to work in the music business, so that kind of musical production wasn't a surprise. However, it was the context of the performances that many deemed unnecessary to take place in a sacred setting such as the church. The departure from traditional worship to what many called sacrilegious made a lot of people uncomfortable. I guess it did make them uncomfortable. This Negro done shot a whole music video in church. <laughs> a reporter for Blaze TV said, It is entirely inappropriate. You have women basically twerking on stage, but hey, it's twerking for the kingdom. We're twerking for the Lord out here. Mike promised that one session of the service would be live streamed, but eventually the stream was removed from online websites. While some argued that the video was withheld due to potential copyright issues of the instrumentals that were used, others suggested that the church was trying to conceal certain aspects of the event from public scrutiny. Yep, I'll take scrutiny for 500, Alex. Following the blasphemous Easter Sunday performance, the church claimed 500 people gave their lives to Christ. Do he even know how to open the doors of the church? That's the question. What song do they play when they open the doors of the church? Now walk it out. Now walk it out. Sinners walk it out. <laughs> this man a mess. This called into question Mike's purpose. Was his agenda to spread the teachings of the Bible? Or was he trying to feed his musical aspirations in the most attention-grabbing way possible? Attention-grabbing for 1,000, Alex. Transformation Church was back in the news in April 2023 when they gladly welcomed Carl Lentz to its staff. Who? 
For those of you who are unaware, we're going to give you a little insight into Carl's background and why his hiring was so controversial. Carl previously worked as a pastor at Hillsong, a global megachurch that's known for its celebrity congregates like Justin Bieber. But in 2020, Carl was fired from Hillsong after it was discovered that he had cheated on his wife and was involved in other moral failures and abusing his power for sexual access. Now, girl, what does all that mean? A hoe? Blackmailing? Blackmailing hoes? Blackmailing to be a hoe? I'm confused. Carl stayed out of the spotlight for the next few years to repair his marriage and spend time with his children. And he popped back up in 2023 when he was offered a staff position at Transformation Church. A rep for the church said, Carl has shown readiness to use his God-given gifts towards the local church again. We believe in Carl, his marriage, his skill set, and his restoration. Who the hell is we? Child, you don't send a recovering alcoholic to go work at the liquor store. Carl later clarified that he was no longer in ministry and his role at Transformation Church didn't involve preaching or overseeing people. That wasn't supposed to be Mike's job either. He was just supposed to be working the sound booth, but here we are. He said, my role is to give perspective and insight where I can. Uh Uh-uh, get somebody else to do. You need to be receiving perspective and insight, okay? (laughs) Receiving, not giving. And here lies another problem. People were concerned about what kind of insight an adulterer was going to give to members of the church. Exactly. Okay. Now he done been fired and sat down. And here y'all go hiring him back. Let him do something else. Cut the grass, be a member on the usher board, sing in the choir, giving insight, talking to people. Uh -uh. Uh-uh, uh-uh, uh-uh. Despite all of his antics, Mike has done a lot of good things for people. In December 2020, he conducted a $3.5 million one-day blessing spree. They gave one family $250,000 to purchase a home. $200,000 went to pay off people's student loans. $1.5 million went to other churches. And $1 million was given to various human service organizations. Okay, Mike, okay. We're going to give you that now. We're going to give you that now. At least you blessing your parishioners. And then in 2021, he gave away $200,000 checks to three living survivors of the Tulsa Race Massacre. Ain't mad at you, Mike. Ain't mad at you for that. Still need to take your ass to seminary, but I ain't mad. The church has also continued to expand its staff and has purchased nearly $67 million in real estate in Tulsa County. There's no doubt Mike has transformed the church and changed his life in the process. But does he have good intentions? Is his heart really into preaching the gospel? Or is he just in it to make a buck and go viral so he can sell more books and create more musical productions? Alex, I'm going to take going viral for $1,200. Now, besties, if you enjoyed this video, let us know down below and thank you I want to say thank you thank you for watching oh, oh, G.